Great. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Eric and, and Thomas on the program committee. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here this afternoon. And as mentioned, the, the topic is uh, genetics and molecular alterations in pancreas cancer and how we apply this information and where we are in 2019. So just acknowledging uh, various disclosures here, none really directly related to, to most of the, the topic, uh, some consulting and some off-label use. So the discussion is going to focus on the molecular landscape of pancreas cancer to review somatic and germline testing in this disease and then the actionability of that information and how it's used. So this is probably familiar to, to many. This is the uh, pancreas cancer uh, genome from the uh, consortium, which describes the key genomic features if, of about 150 people who underwent a resection of pancreas cancer. And as I think everybody knows that this disease is characterized by the four key driver oncogenes with KRAS, P53, uh, CDKN2, and SMAD4, none of which are directly actionable uh, for now, although potentially the small subset of patients who have a KRAS uh, G12C mutation, uh, there's drugs in the clinic, and this is possibly something that may have application for that small subset. I'm not aware of anybody yet with pancreas cancer who's received one of these drugs, but I'm sure that's about to, about to happen. Increasingly, there's this interest in the KRAS wild-type subset, which in the past was thought to be related to issues of technical limitations and cellularity, et cetera, but it appears to be a, a real finding of anywhere from 6 to 8 percent of people with pancreas cancer, and we'll circle back to that in a, in a moment. This is from the Know Your Tumor program from Michael Bishvayan and uh, his team at Pancreas Cancer Action Network and Prothera, where they attempted to uh, describe the actionability of this genomic information in pancreas cancer. And I think there's various ways of doing this. Uh, I wouldn't say there's one clear-cut consensus on this, but from their perspective, about half there was no actionability, about a quarter were highly actionable, and a, an additional quarter uh, potential uh, application in pancreas cancer. And we'll discuss uh, some of these targets as we go uh, today. So there are a number now of large-scale uh, genomic profiling projects. This is a recent one that was uh, published in Cancer Discovery last year from the Daimler-Farber group. Uh, they used a real-time uh, genomic profiling in the, in the CLIA environment and uh, also used RNA sequencing uh, for an integrated analysis of these data. And the summary findings from this data set were about 40% uh, percent were theoretically actionable and in a quarter there were two or more uh, relevant findings and in this data set 8% percent had germline finding of uh, significance. So looking at this subset of KRAS wild type, this is from the MSK uh, genomic analysis that was published a couple of years ago in clinical cancer uh, research. Of that uh, initial group that we looked at, there were 19 patients who were KRAS uh, wild type. And it's pretty clear now uh, if across uh, multiple different uh, genomic analyses that this subgroup of KRAS wild type is very important. It may be enriched in younger people, and it's certainly enriched in alternative oncogenic uh, drivers uh, beyond KRAS. And for example, uh, FGF fusions have been identified, occasional NTRAC fusion, uh, ROS uh, fusion, uh, BRAF uh, mutation, all again of which uh, there are now drugs in the clinic. Not in our data set, but in a subsequent analysis, and again, with there's a number of emerging papers on this, NRG1 fusions have also been identified in pancreas cancer. And from our data set, we had seven. It's a low incidence event, but I suspect we've missed some just based on, on the technical issues, but about probably about a half a percent of people with, with pancreas cancer. But when you add up all of these fusions in this KRAS wild type uh, subset, it, it gets to be a number uh, that's meaningful in terms of application. 
So this is a schematic for how this works. Uh, so NRG1 is, uh, binds uh, ligands to ERBB3 and activates downstream RAS-RAF and the PI3 kinase and other uh, pathways. So there are a number of uh, TKIs and monoclonal antibodies that can affect both HER2 and HER3. And there's a couple of published examples in pancreas cancer. So this is one from uh, the German group, from Heinegger colleagues, and this illustrates two patients, uh, both young patients, both KRAS wild type, both had NRG1 fusions, and one received a fatina, but that's the top line uh, A, and, and the second patient received a combination of erlotinib and uh, pertuzumab, again, affecting the HER2, HER3 pathways. And you can see both of these patients had a significant response. Uh, we've also seen that uh, internally, and and uh, other groups have, have similar observations in this regards. So moving to the topic of mismatch repair deficiency in pancreas, there isn't a huge amount of literature until relatively recently, and some discussion of whether these findings were uh, driven by germline alterations or whether they were somatic in, in origin. So our group looked at this in 833 consecutive patients who'd undergone molecular sequencing and using uh, a combination of uh, mismatch uh, repair protein analysis uh, and using bioinformatics analysis identified uh, seven patients who had mismatch repair deficiency, so a little under 1%. Of those, not part of this project, but they had been treated on various studies, and four of, of the seven had meaningful uh, therapeutic response to a checkpoint inhibitor therapy. We know on pancreas cancer, like in other diseases, it's associated with mismatch repair protein uh, expression loss, high mutational uh, tumor load, but maybe not as high as in some other diseases. And if you use a bioinformatics analysis, elevated MSI sensor score. So looking at this uh, graphically, the average patient with pancreas cancer is a relatively low uh, tumor mutation burden in the order of three to four mutations per megabase. But this group on the right, the mismatch repair deficient patients, and in our analysis, they were all uh, germline events, although we've subsequently identified one patient who had, appears to have had some somatic uh, mismatch repair deficiency. There's a subgroup there that have an intermediate uh, level of uh, tumor mutation load, and that's a subgroup that is being looked at with regard to potential application of immune therapy in, in pancreas cancer beyond uh, combination approaches. So moving uh, to germline testing, it's pretty clear there's a relatively significant pickup in terms of germline mutations in pancreas cancer. This was an initial pass uh, identifying 17% who had a germline finding. Uh, we looked at this in more detail. About a third were bracket one or bracket two. Uh, Seven percent of people had two uh, pathogenic alterations in the germline, and about half occurred in DNA damage repair genes. So there's this question, if you do have a germline mutation, are you likely to do better independent of treatment? We really don't know this, but there's some hints that maybe uh, from this data set and from the data set at Dana-Farber uh, as well. So that, that question is sort of out there. Summarizing the germline uh, analysis that have been done in pancreas cancer, these are the major uh, reports, I think, bar, bar one that I, I need to add in. But again, the, the findings, I think, are pretty consistent. There's a significant pickup of anywhere from three to the high end being 19%. Our, our set looked at a, a lot of genes, many of which are not relevant uh, to pancreas cancer. Most of the findings were in genes that were previously known to be associated with pancreas pancreas cancer. But the key finding is, uh, across multiple uh, analysis here, is that uh, about 40% of patients wouldn't have met guidelines for testing and would have been missed had uh, one gone by a traditional uh, approach in terms of germline uh, evaluation. So that's uh, the collective data set and uh, other data have led to updates in terms of recommendations from the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network panel uh, this year in pancreas cancer. And very specifically for uh, tumor-based profiling, it's recommended for any individual who's a, a candidate for additional anti-cancer therapy uh, with a preference for tumor. I think we still have to fully understand the, the ramifications of liquid biopsies in pancreas cancer. 
And germline testing is now recommended, uh, not just considered in pancreas cancer with use of a multi-gene panel. So for the last few minutes, just a little bit on the therapeutics. This is kind of a landscape picture of what's happening in terms of uh, options for pancreas cancer. You'll see there are a few red boxes, and actually more red boxes than in the past. They speak to, uh, to targeted approaches, although erlotinib was really evaluated in a non-selected uh, uh, setting. Uh, but more recently, pembrolizumab for mismatch repair deficiency, larotrectinib for NTRAC infusions, uh, disease agnostic, and potentially uh, we hope to see within the, in the, the calendar year uh, a labrib uh, being approved in the germline uh, setting for pancreas cancer as a maintenance strategy. So a consideration as we think about uh, treatment approaches in pancreas cancer, obviously predominated by cytotoxic therapies, but increasingly need to think about early molecular testing and germline testing for this disease. And speaking to some of this data, you'll see how important this is. So looking at this in a different way, about 16% of people with pancreas cancer will have alterations in DNA damage repair genes, both somatic and uh, germline, and that's again been a fairly consistent figure now, I would say, across a number of sets. We know that some of these responses, um, particularly in the BRCA setting with platinum and PARP inhibitors can be uh, particularly effective and, and really quite durable for these patients with the occasional uh, complete response uh, that's maintained for a number of years. Partly predicated on, on the concept of synthetic lethality leading to ineffective um, pathways of DNA repair, uh, apoptosis, cell death, uh, et cetera. And then a couple of other data sets from, again, from the Know Your, Tum know Your Tumor Project, which is providing a wealth of informative information in terms of how we should be thinking about this disease. Uh, their data uh, indicated that uh, there doesn't appear to be a prognostic effect in terms of uh, harboring a DNA damage response gene mutation. Um, however, with platinum, there is a predictive effect, and that effect is significant, both in the adjuvant setting and in the metastatic setting. And we looked at this too. Wongi Park from our group presented these data at ASCO and also uh, identified a pretty clear discrimination if you have uh, mutations in HRD genes compared to those that did not in terms of any treatment and certainly with regard to first-line platinum therapy. But we didn't see this with regard to non-platinum-based uh, therapy. So more to come on this topic. So from the therapeutic perspective at ASCO this year, I think many are well aware that uh, Alaparib was evaluated in a maintenance setting following induction platinum therapy. So two selection factors here, uh, germline BRCA mutation and four months of stable or responding disease, at least uh, to platinum-based therapy. And these are, are the data, and Dr. Golan will review these in more detail later, but there was a doubling of uh, patients who had, were progression-free uh, compared to placebo, and one can argue here about the placebo control, but at the time of that this was designed, that was an acceptable approach. And you can see that some of these responses were quite durable. Nonetheless, there wasn't uh, a definitive overall survival advantage, possibly uh, in part because of crossover and in part because uh, both arms subsequently went on to receive platinum at the time of progression, and presumably those that were on placebo maintained uh, their sensitivity to the benefit of platinum therapy. And we'll, again, have more details on post-treatment uh, analysis at, at later time points. So very briefly, looking at PARP inhibitors at monotherapy, there's, again, a fair bit of data now in pancreas cancer. Pretty clear that there's single-agent activity, but in the platinum-sensitive group, single-agent olaparib, about 20% uh, response rate, with rucaparib in both germline and somatic uh, BRCA uh, alterations, there were also responses. And in, at AACR this year, Kim Rice Binder and her team presented a, a similar maintenance ap approach to the POLO study using recaparib and identifying good progression-free survival and a response rate of about 37%. This was a single-arm, non-randomized uh, trial. 
It is important, though, that the patient has platinum sensitivity. Uh, our uh, group looked at this in patients who were all platinum exposed and uh, all but one uh, platinum progressors, and we saw essentially no objective responses with a PARP inhibitor. So that's a key point uh, for practice. So where is the, the field going with regard to this? Uh, I think maintenance therapy is uh, established, looking at this in a broader uh, population and potentially a non-germline population and in patients with other DDR, HRD gene mutations. I think we need to drill down more on this and understanding the zygosity issues and loss of heterozygosity because they will further refine the individuals that might benefit. And of course, there's uh, uh, several combination strategies poised to, uh, to build on uh, these observations in terms of a proof of principle. So summing up here with regard to genomic analysis in pancreas cancer, uh, I would make the argument that we need to consider this for, for all patients, uh, I would say both. I think increasingly the data suggests without any new drugs and just thinking about platinum and DDR, HRD gene mutations, we can make a difference in terms of outcome for patients based on the tools that, that are available. Uh, so this should be done early. It's still hard to see that this information will be available as yet in real time for immediate decision making, but hopefully uh, that can happen. Um, pretty clear that there's proof of principle with regard to uh, uh, DNA damage repair targeting approaches. And just remembering uh, the somatic, the KRAS wild type group that's enriched for uh, potential therapeutic options for these patients. So thank you. I will stop there.